Welcome to Mr. Post Frame. For those of you who are new to the channel, my name is Paul. We talk about all kinds of different things regarding barnuminiums, post frame builds. Uh, today, uh, we are going to talk about pier foundations. We build a lot of barnuminiums and we typically will use piers. We get lots of questions, that, questions on that, how we do it. Um, so we're going to cover all that in this video. But before we get started, don't forget we have a Patreon group for self-builders. For those who want to self-build their own barn dominium, their own building, we have a group. Uh, it's a community of other self-builders where we can talk back and forth about uh, the different processes involved. We have a live every month. We have questions, question and answers every week. So check that out if you're interested. And second, if you're wanting to design your own post frame building or barndo, reach out to us, uh, design at Mr. Post Frame, and we can help you out with that. But let's go ahead and jump in to the show. All right guys, so throughout the years of building barndos, I've used Midwest Perma Columns products. So they're wet set brackets, dry set brackets. They also have perma columns. Um, one question we get a lot is what is the difference between a perma column and like a wet set bracket and you know, kind of which is easier to use. We typically will use the wet set bracket. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna talk about uh, what we do to do uh, pour our piers. And then we will break down the perma column and the wet set, kind of what the cost difference is and talk about like the ease of installation um, versus each other. But when we lay out our buildings, uh, one thing that we do is we have uh, someone come in and level the building site. So we already know what size our building is. So we make sure that the site is nice and level and that we have four inches of rock on the ground. Um, that helps with a couple reasons. When you're drilling all your footings, they're not sticking way out of the ground. You only have to have them out of the ground a couple inches. And two, when you're building, you have all that rock down, you're not uh, building in, in the mud. So once we get that done, we'll come in, we'll lay out our building. Uh, typically, all of our piers are spaced eight foot on center, and then we wet set, use wet set brackets. So we'll use a 16 inch auger which typically gets us between an 18 and 20 inch in diameter hole. And we go in our area, we're in the Midwest, the frost line is 42 inches. We will usually go 48 to 54 inches deep with our piers. Um, we use 4,000 PSI concrete. Um, we'll fill all the holes and then we'll come back, put our string lines up and set all of our brackets. So let's just talk about um, that process. If you have a 40 foot wide building by 100, we will set our string lines exactly that. Now we use all uh, girts that are on the outside edge of the columns. So when we go to set our wet set brackets, we set them in a minimum of inch and a half. We shoot for an inch and five eighths to inch and three quarter because our wet set brackets are five inches and then our posts are between five and a quarter and five and a half. So by setting an inch and five eighths to an inch and three quarter, that gives us room to move that column back and forth a little bit to fine tune it. So they're all in a nice straight line. That's how we like to do it. Uh, you could um, set your string lines in an inch and a half on each side. So you could set your bracket right up against that um, string line if you want, if that's easier for you. There are guys that do that but we find it easiest just to set the string lines the exact dimensions of the building. Well, let's talk about what a perma column is first. So a perma column is a precast concrete column. It's 10,000 PSI, it's typically six by six, and then the bracket is pre-attached to the top of that um, concrete pier and rebar run all the way down in it. You can get them in lengths of five foot, six foot, and seven foot. And so you would still drill the same size hole you would have to put um, a column cookie or basically it's like a footing pad at the bottom of the hole which you set that on and then you set that up against your string line backfill it and you're done uh, I, find, I feel like these are really good for people that can't get concrete there are places even where we live if i didn't uh, personally know the owner of a concrete company i would have a real hard time getting concrete for my peers um, 
I have a buddy that lives out in the mountains in Montana. He used perma columns because they couldn't get concrete trucks into them. So it's a really good way to have a permanent foundation system if you can't get concrete. We're actually going to be building a building this uh, spring or this summer uh, with those. So we will cover all that in detail when we do that. Um, but they are a great uh, option if you can't get concrete. Now, they are pretty heavy. I think they weigh somewhere between 165 and 200 pounds, depending on the length. But you can throw a, a bolt through there and lift them with your skid steer, set them in place. Um, the price difference between that and doing a concrete pier and a bracket is probably about $100 difference. So the perma column is going to be roughly $100 more than if you pour a concrete pier and put a wet set bracket in it. Now that does not include labor on either either end. That's just the cost of the material. So like if you're doing um, a concrete pier, you're looking at roughly a third of con a 30 yard of concrete per hole plus your bracket plus all of the hardware to attach your column to the bracket. And that's going to be somewhere around $120. And that's using a three ply two by six column. Whereas a three ply two by six perma column, which is the concrete precast column with the bracket attached to it, you're looking at probably $225 by the time you put your uplift hardware on it, um, get your hardware for attaching your column to that bracket. So it is about $100 more, but uh, you know, it might be a little bit easier for some people because when you're pouring all of your footings at once, there is a time concern of getting your brackets set and you have to get them set accurately. So if you're not, if you're kind of unsure about that, it might be a better option for you to use the perma columns where there isn't really a time constraint on it because the brackets are already attached to the concrete column and you just have to make sure you line it up with your string line and make sure it's plumb. So, you're, that's kind of something you're going to have to decide on your own. Um, we do a lot of these piers with wet set brackets, so we've gotten pretty good at it, pretty efficient. So that's not a concern of ours. But if you do misplace that wet set bracket, it can cause you some issues. Another question that I get a lot is when to use a dry set bracket versus a wet set bracket. And that's an easy answer for, uh, for me. Whenever we do a continuous footing wall, whether it be just a concrete wall or an ICF wall, we will use dry set brackets. As far as piers go, we use all wet set brackets. And then our corners and our garage door openings are dry set universal brackets, which uh, we can show you those in this video. Um, but that's how we do it. All of these products you can get from Midwest Permacolum. Um, we typically build Barnuminium. So in order for a client to get financing for a Barnuminium, you can't have your post in the ground. So that's why we use uh, Midwest Permacolum. I've used them um, since I started building and I really like them. I believe in them. Um, questions we get, are they ICC rated, uh, how do they withstand wind, how do they withstand shear, all, they exceed above and beyond all of the requirements in the building code. So whether you're using a dry set, wet set, or the permacom itself, they all exceed the ratings that you need. So I would not be afraid to use them in any of my personal builds or any in any manner. Um, so just keep that in mind. If you go to their website, they have all the documentation of shear, uplift, all that kind of stuff that you would need maybe for your county. Um, I just had a client uh, that's in North Carolina. I provided him with all that information that he could take to his county and get uh, that foundation method approved for his building. If you guys are interested in any of these products, I've recently formed a partnership with Midwest Permacolum because I believe in them. Um, so if you can check, you can check them out on their website or you can check them out um, on our website. We're going to put a, a page up on ours. We can get you a discount on those. Um, so if you're interested, uh, just send us an email design at Mr. Post Frame. We can help you figure out what you need for your building, how much what you need for your building, and then how much it would cost to get them directly shipped to your location. We can do all that for you. But uh, let's continue the video. Um, and answer some more of the questions we get on these. So the reason we use universal brackets, especially on garage door openings, is so 
when we set our columns, we can get those perfectly spaced. It gives you just a little bit of play left and right. Whereas if you put a wet set bracket there and you don't get it exactly perfect, um, you might have problems with your garage door opening size. Now I hit, I did try on the last two footing jobs I did to set wet set brackets in the corner. So I measured off the string lines, the thickness of the column, the thickness of my girt, and tried to set that perfectly. And then I'll cut half of that uh, bracket off. I'm not sure how that's going to work. I think it's going to work good. I think I did a good job getting them set where I wanted. But as far as garage door openings go, I use the inside edge of the column as my opening for my garage door. So I want those to be perfect. So I just use dry set brackets there. They're a universal L bracket. You use a carriage bolt so that you can sink that carriage bolt flush and then your trims go right over it and it works out really well. So just to continue with the process, uh, the way we form up our holes is we, like I said, we use a 16 inch auger that gets us about 18, 19 inches typically. We get oversized sono tubes. So we'll get a 20 to 22 inch sono tube and then we cut them in, we usually get them in 12 foot lengths and we'll usually cut them um, about 13 to 15 inches and then we'll cut them down the side so we can collapse them within themselves, stick them down in the hole, spread them out, and then we run a couple sheet metal screws into them and then pack dirt and rock around them to hold them in place. That way, when we pour our concrete in that hole, it is filling that whole void with concrete and there's no space that we have to fill in with dirt or anything like that. And it works out really well. One, it reduces the cost of your sono tubes because they are expensive if you have to buy them they're somewhere around ten dollars a linear foot um, i do use i do sometimes get them from a metal manufacturer where i just take the tubes that the metal comes on and cut those down but i can't always get those so when i do i buy them and i usually get 20 to 22 inch cut them collapse them stick them in there spread them out and it works good it saves a ton of time and effort and getting your your holes formed up what happens if you hit rock most of the time where we are, we have pretty good soil where we don't hit rock, but a six inch rock can cause you a ton of, ton of problems. So if I, as soon as I know I'm hitting a rock, I stop, I'll get the shovel and get that out of there so it doesn't push my auger to one side or the other. So that's very important. If you have a lot of rock or limestone, it might keep you from being able to do a pier foundation. We did a build last year where there was just limestone everywhere and we had to do a continuous footing wall because there was just no way I could drill nice holes down through all that stone. So we had to excavate and put in a continuous wall. So keep that in mind, if you are in a really rocky area with big rocks, you might have uh, trouble using a pier foundation. Uh, so if you're looking for sonotubes, I buy them from, you need to find a concrete supplier and you'll be able to get them through them or you can get online and order them. Uh, Menards, Home Depot, you can probably order them all through there. They probably won't have um, the larger sizes, size ones without having to order them. And I'm telling you, get the bigger ones, cut them down the side and collapse them. You'll be a lot happier with your life. It's a lot easier. It's a lot quicker. Um, as far as what PSI concrete we use, we use 4,000 PSI concrete. Um, we do not vibrate our concrete. We pour it at a slump that... Um, it's not necessary. It goes in there, it fills up the hole. And one thing to keep in mind that a lot of people don't talk about when you vibrate concrete, you got to be really careful that you don't over vibrate it because what you'll do is you'll sink all the aggregate to the bottom and you'll end up weakening your pier. So we don't do it unless we have to, like on a ICF wall where it's recommended by the manufacturer, we will. But other than that, I don't use a vibrator on my piers. Another question I got is when to add calcium. So we will do pier foundations when it can get below freezing. So that's when I add calcium. What that does is it speeds up the curing process. So typically you don't need it unless you're pouring and it's going to be you know, below freezing and you're worried about that pier freezing and not being able to cure properly. So what we'll do, we'll add 2% calcium to the concrete mix, pour it, that helps speed up the curing process and then we will set all our brackets once they're nice and um, stable we'll, we will pile straw up around the top of the pier anything that's in the ground is going to be insulated it's not going to freeze it's going to cure properly so, but you do want to protect that top from 
the wind and freezing temperatures. Another question is how do we estimate the amount of concrete for our pier? So you just wanna take the diameter of your hole. So what I'll do, I mean, I've done this enough that I just use 18 inches as my estimate for my diameter. And then I'll take an average of all my depths, which is usually pretty consistent within a couple inches. And then I just use a calcul uh, concrete calculator app online and you just put those dimensions in and it'll tell you what you need per footing, which if you're around 48 inches deep, 18 inches wide, you're gonna need about a third a yard of concrete per footing. And then if you're gonna get a truck that, um, a typical concrete truck, you're gonna wanna get uh, an extra half to a yard of concrete so you don't come up short. The concrete trucks we use are mix on site. I usually need two trucks, so I pay for what I use. Um, so it's not really, really a concern for me, but when you are using a typical truck that comes with the concrete already mixed, you need to order a little bit extra so you don't come up short. As far as which pier do we pour first, if we have um, a lot of garage door openings where we're gonna use uh, dry set universal brackets, we will pour all of those in all of the corners first because we're not gonna be wet setting brackets there. So we'll pour those first and then we will go to the other piers that way it buys us a little extra time if that concrete sets up quicker than usual. If the temperature, temperatures outside are cool, it's gonna take a little bit longer for the concrete to set up, so you usually have plenty of time. Where you're gonna run into trouble is in the middle of summer when it's 90, 100 degrees, it's been dry out where that ground is gonna suck the moisture out of your piers faster, and so you're gonna to wanna to be able to um, have as much time as possible. So we will have all of our string lines ready to be put up, we'll pour a row, get that string line up and we'll keep checking it. Uh, so once it's time, we can, we can start setting our wet set brackets. So another big problem that people have is trying to decide how far out of the ground do I set my pier? So like I said, one important thing to start with is a level building pad. You can do all this on unlevel ground, some of your piers will be sticking way out, but it's, it's a lot more work than it's worth. Now I've done this before. I built a 30 by 40 uh, for my sister and brother-in-law, and we can, take, we can take a shot of this right now where the piers were a couple feet out of the ground, and then I brought fill in later. That is not the ideal way to do it. And the reason is because it's hard to set up your string lines uh, where they're level, and it just, it kind of makes it a lot more difficult than it needs to be. So if you can start with a level building site, so have either you prepare it, um, go out about 10, 15 feet farther than your building pad and make sure you're nice and level. Then bring in four inches of rock, cover your whole building pad in rock. So now you have a level building site, you have your four inches of gravel already down. And then what I do is I'll hit the four corners of my building and see which is the highest point. Cause you're gonna, you're gonna be off probably an inch or two from corner to corner as far as height goes. And then I will start with that pier and I will set that pier maybe an inch above that gravel. And then I set my uh, rotary laser on that pier and then I will set all the rest of them the same height. So the most my piers are gonna be out of the ground is two, three inches. And then once we pour them all, We'll come in um, and build our building. So building goes up and then once the building's up, I'll come in with rock and I will uh, add rock so that that rock is level with the top of all of the piers. So now none of my piers are sticking way out of the ground so it's not gonna cost me a bunch of extra money in rock to get that up to the height I need. I have the minimum four to six inches of rock for drainage under my slab. And then when I put my two inch polystyrene down, it goes right over the top of all of the piers. Then I have a five inch slab. And now my finished floor is gonna be about seven inches um, above those piers. So by doing that, that gives me a nice grade away from the house to control water issues. So if you do it this way, you're gonna have really good success. It's gonna force you to have a slope away from your building and you're not gonna have water issues. Let's just talk about some of the things you need uh, during this process as far as tools. You're gonna need a skid steer, 
with an auger. So that's kind of a given. If you don't have it, you can rent a skid steer and an auger for a day for probably less than $500. And it shouldn't take you um, any longer than a day to drill all your holes. So if that's, if that's the case, we're going to have to rent something, maybe lay out your building, get all your piers marked, and then rent your machine so you can just come in and you can drill them all. Uh, you're going to need string lines. You're going to need some 2 by 4s for batter boards at the corners. You're going to need some stakes. Metal stakes work uh, the best. Uh, they drive into the ground easier. Um, they have screw holes already in them. You're going to need some long uh, tape measures depending on the size of your building. I have several 100 foot tapes. I have a couple 200 foot tapes. Typically we only use the 100 foots with, for what we're doing unless you just have a massive building. Another thing that you're going to need is spray paint. We'll use uh, high visibility orange paint to mark all of our pier locations. And what I do to make sure I'm centering my auger where it needs to be is I'll take an actual sono tube after I might mark my eight foot on center and I will set that sono tube along that right over the top of the string line and imagine where my post is going to be and then I'll take that spray paint and I'll make a circle there so when I come in with my auger I can center it in that circle and that assures that I'm going to have my footing in the right place. Uh, another thing you're going to need when you're pouring the concrete is you're going to need some trowels to smooth it off. We typically will take like a two foot piece of two by four to screed off the top of the sono tubes just to flatten out the concrete. You're going to need a couple shovels. Um, another thing you need a compactor, just a hand compactor to compact the bottom of your holes. We will drill the hole, clean it out the best we can with uh, the auger. And then what we'll do is we'll just take a hand tamper and tamp the bottom of that hole, which is usually, it doesn't compact much, but we just want to make sure that's good and compact. So when that concrete goes in there, it's, it's not going to sink or anything over the next few days. Another really important tool that if you don't have, and you're going to be building this all on yourself, uh, is a rotary uh, laser. That is going to make your life way easier if you have one of these. We use it constantly throughout our entire build. So if you don't have one, um, my suggestion would be either to buy one for your project and then resell it. Um, if you buy a really good one, we use the uh, Stabila LAR 350. Um, you would have no problem reselling that and getting most of your money back out of it. If you don't, try to find somewhere where you can rent one because it will make things a lot easier and you'll be a lot more confident that all your peers are going to be close. Another thing to not worry about, you want your peers to be as close to level as possible, but if they're off, you know, even a half inch, an inch to each other, you're going to be fine. You can make up all of that adjustment in you when you put your columns in. You can add, if you're an inch low on one, you can add that inch back. We cover that in some of our videos, how to do that. You're just never going to be absolutely perfect on every single one, um, but there's an easy way to make up for that when you're preparing your columns. I hope this video was helpful for you guys. Don't forget um, that we do have a partnership with Midwest Perma Column. If you guys want to reach out to us, uh, design at Mr. Post Frame. Um, we can talk. We can figure out what is your best option for your specific needs. I can get you pricing, what it would cost to get them shipped directly to uh, your job site or your location. Um, they're a great product. It's a permanent foundation. You won't be sorry um, if you use these. You can see that uh, you know this is all we've used. I believe in them. I wouldn't be recommending them if I didn't. But I think this video will help a lot of you. If you have any other questions, leave it in the comments. We'll do our best to answer them. Thanks for watching, and we'll catch you on the next video.